excited today because we have a special guest speaker who's joining us, one of our very own coaches, Dr. Courtney McNamara, and she's going to tell you everything you need to know about how not to destroy the relationships with your loved ones, with your children, and still maintain an incredible level of productivity. I mean, Courtney, I, I, I'm just tremendously impressed by how Courtney manages to balance it all. And, and she's going to tell you there are certain myths out there like you can have it all. She's going to bust up some of these myths and really get straight to the heart of what you need to do, what is so important that you need to do when you have a time crunch to sustain your productivity and still nurture important relationships, especially with your children uh, in your life. And this session is going to be completely valuable for any of you who have, have feel time constraints. I mean, some of the things Courtney's going to share with you are valuable productivity tips, uh, not just for those with, with small children, but uh, for those of you who might be working a full-time job, part-time job, who might have uh, other constraints or might feel like you're panicking with your back against the wall and not getting enough time done. Um, just guaranteed stick around. We're going to bring Courtney on in a minute and you're going to learn a lot from her. Um, I can see several of you are joining. We really have a truly international uh, community. Um, this Fast Track Grad platform, this is my way. Uh, I'm Professor David Stuckler. This is my way of giving back because, you know, I was in your shoes as a graduate student, uh, you know, not so long ago. And and I had a very rocky road. I came from a, a small town in, in Texas in the United States. And uh, I was a first generation grad. My my, my parents didn't even know why I was bothering to go to grad school. They thought I should just go work and make some money uh, for the family. And and I feel like every bump on the road I managed to hit. And, uh, you know, I, I was on the verge of uh, – I dropped out one semester, was on the verge of flunking out another. And it was only through a lot of support and working through a lot of mistakes that I figured out the ways uh, that – that I, that I believe anybody can get on the right road in the path to a smooth, easy ride by taking the right steps. Um, fast forward, I was able to get into Yale as a graduate student, go on to do a PhD in Cambridge, and ultimately go on to start on the tenor track at Harvard and become a full professor at Oxford University. Um, now I'm coming to you from my office at University of Bocconi in Milan, which I had the great fortune of being able to choose my favorite place um, to, to land um, for, for my ultimate job. And, and again, I've set up this program to be a living, breathing, open access community uh, to, to give back and give you support so that you guys don't fall into some of the most common pitfalls that I fell into and that I see so many grads fall into. So guys, um, many of you are going to be watching on the replay. I always love to know who is watching on the replay. If that's you, uh, hit in the comment uh, replay. Let us know that you're on Team Replay just in the comments. And especially as Courtney is talking, I want you guys to just uh, hit like. Let us know if some of the things Courtney says resonates with your experience, if they're things that you've struggled with personally or know of others. And, and again, those of you watching later, if you put your comments through at the bottom, uh, Courtney and I both will be sure to to get those an your questions answered and connect you to a lot of the support resources that we have 100% free in, in our open access community here at Fast Track Grad. So with that, um, I am going to bring Courtney on. Hey, Courtney, Hi. welcome, welcome. <laughs> Um, just, uh, yeah, say, say hi to everybody and, you know, uh, I mean, need no introduction for me, but, uh, say hi and I'm going to hand over to you here in just a second. Sounds great. Hi everyone. Um, as David said, my name is Courtney McNamara. Um, I'm really excited to be here today. This is a topic that I'm, I'm very passionate about. And as I'll mention again later, I hope this is just the beginning of a conversation and that we can continue these sorts of conversations um, in the fast track group in the future. So talking about what it's like to be a parent and also managing your work life. Yeah, and Courtney, I'm glad you mentioned that because, you know, so often I think what happens is grad school can sometimes be a very isolating, lonely experience. And yet one thing that you and I have both learned from, from the Fast Track community is that many of the challenges are common. And just all, all too often, the, you, know, you might learn hard skills in your programs, but some of these softer skills about you know managing your life and keeping it all together – there's there, there some of the bigger challenges that you need to get right to really be your most successful. It's not just about the knowledge and skills you have, but also your mindset, your productivity, keep, keeping other aspects of your life 
healthy. And so this is a community to have those conversations that the things we just don't talk about enough uh, in, in the ivory towers and in the universities. So um, really great. And Courtney, just you just got another paper out. Uh, I mean, Cor- <laughs> Courtney uh, leads some of our systematic review sessions uh, for our students who um, really tremendously pr- productive. And, and Courtney, I mean, I'm amazed at how, how you are so productive. You just had a great systematic review come out on COVID and precariousness. Uh, uh, so well done. And I do remember even in the group where we live submitted that manuscript <laughs> yeah, that's uh, right. together. So uh, if, if any of you guys want to see Courtney's latest paper, we actually submitted it live in this group uh, in the spirit uh, of our open ethos. So everybody could learn from from how we go about in our experience submitting a paper to a journal and all the hiccups and pitfalls you can possibly run into. But yeah, really excited to share with everybody, Courtney, that that one we live submitted uh, just about just about a month, a month and a half ago, I, I believe, is now is now out in print. So if you want that, I'm going to leave a copy of Courtney's paper in the chat. <laughs> so you can also see that Courtney's very, very serious, uh, high performing rising star researcher. It's just awesome. OK, as we have some comments, Elaine, really good to have you in the chat. Uh, greetings from the Sangis. Sorry, I'm messing up the pronunciation to traditional territory. Uh, again, we really love this community because we have got people from uh, Australia, Aboriginal populations, from uh, Europe, from uh, low-income countries, some from Nigeria. Here, welcome all. Um, with that, Courtney, I'm gonna. I'm. It's my turn to step back, and I'm gonna hand you the floor. I'm gonna be in the messages, uh, chatting with everybody. So yeah, Courtney, uh, over to you. Perfect. Alrighty, so I'll just um, start off with a little bit about my professional background. Um, So right now I'm a senior researcher at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology in Trondheim, Norway. Um, Before that, I did my PhD at the University of York in England. Um, After finishing my PhD, I did a postdoc here in Norway um, for about three years. At the, at the end of that postdoc, I was awarded a large research grant by the Norwegian Research Council um, for a four-year project, and I'm about halfway through that now. Now, in terms of my more personal or family life, um, I'm a mom of three, so my oldest son is Orson. He's four years old now. And about a year and a half ago, I gave birth to twins, Chloe and Owen. Um, and so, actually, it's just been now... Um, about two months that I've been back full-time at work. Um, so I went back in September. Um, and, and if you know anything about the parental leave policies in Scandinavian countries, and you know that I was in an extremely privileged position. Um, so for my first son, I got 12 months of paid leave. And for the twins, I got 14 months of, of paid leave. And I did things a little bit differently um, each time around. So with my son, I I did those 12 months sort of all in one go. And when I came back to work after 12 months, I came back at 100%. Now with the twins, at around nine months, I came back to work at about 25%. And then every few months, I would sort of bump myself up another 25%. So um, a few months, I'd go up to 50%, then 75%. And then again, um, in September, I came back full time. Now, in the in the time since the twins were born, um, or actually just in the, in the past year, I've published about um, six uh, journal articles, um, some of these in high impact journals like the British Medical Journal or the International Journal of Epidemiology and Community Health. Um, but I want to say that having been being able to, to to publish these papers while also taking care of my kids and not even be, being back at work full time, um, I sort of want to offer a little bit of a disclaimer, and that's that you know I still don't have it completely all figured out. Um, I think work walking this line between being an academic um, and being a, a caretaker is a really hard one to walk. And, and like I said earlier, I really hope that today is just the start of the conversation. Um, and again, that we can use this sort of a fast track forum as a forum for, for talking about um, some of these softer issues, like what it's like to be a parent um, and, and to manage your life also as an academic. 
Okay, so what is parental burnout? Well, first I wanna step back and talk for a minute about academic burnout. Now, David often talks about um, academic burnout where maybe you feel like you're losing steam in your work or you're more tired than usual. Um, maybe you're losing interest in your research topic. So it's just really difficult to get to your computer every day and, and get done the things that you really need to get done. Um, but if you're a parent, you also really need to watch out for parental burnout, um, which in its own way can result in sort of this emotional exhaustion. Now, parental burnout is not only bad in its own right, but as you can imagine, or maybe as you've already experienced, it can also impact on your work life. And likewise, academic burnout can impact on your family life and contribute to the, you know, the stressors that you have going on at home. So what is parent, parental burnout? Where does it come from? Now, parental burnout is typically characterized, again, by this overwhelming sense of emotional exhaustion, um, a feeling of being drained, um, both mentally and physically. Um, sometimes it can manifest itself in this sort of feeling um, of, a, of a distancing, of some kind of emotional distancing from your child or children, or an overall sense of parental ineffectiveness. Now, all of these feelings will manifest differently for different people. So in some people, this results in things like anxiety or depression. In other people, it might manifest in terms of like guilt or anger or rage. And as a society, I think we're hearing more and more about cases of parental burnout, and especially in the context of the current pandemic. Now, I saw this really interesting poll, which was done in Britain um, in February 2021. And this is a poll of parents who have children under the age of 10. And this found, you know, that a shocking almost 50% of parents feel burned out. Um, a third of them often feel lonely. Another third say that having children at home has negative, negatively affected their work. And this sort of last statistic at the end, I think is just really shocking that one in 10 feel like crying every single day. Um, so this is a huge, but also common uh, problem. So, so then the question becomes, where is this parental burnout coming from? And I think one big place that it's coming from in general is just this sort of pressure from society and social media um, that's telling us either implicitly or explicitly that we can have it all. Um, we just need to work really hard. So you can be a top academic, you can be a top parent, uh, you can have the perfect house. Um, and on top of all of this, I think we're living through this era of um, hyper parenting, uh, hyper parenting. Um, so you've probably heard terms like tiger parents or, or helicopter parents. And here the idea is that parents should be very, very involved in their, in their caregiving roles. So your kids should be at the top of their um, academic game. You should be signing them up for all sorts of extracurricular activities. And of course, all of this is supposed to fit on top of your you know, normal nine to five working day. And this isn't just about women. I think women have it particularly bad, um, but men also suffer when, when both work and parenting are these sort of around the clock intensive activities. And as I mentioned before, you know, now of course there's a pandemic, which means that a lot of people are working from home also while being full-time caregivers. Um, so in thinking about these issues, one of the first things to know is that if you do feel like this, or if you've ever felt like this, really, you're not alone. Um, feeling like this is completely normal. I think feeling overwhelmed happens to all parents at one time or another. And the trick is really to learn how to manage some of these stressors um, and find resources to help relieve stress and keep you on track with your academic goals. So again, I'll be the first to admit that Really, I don't always get it right, but I think I get it right enough that when I fall out of balance of sort of with the balance of managing my, my work and my family, I at least have an idea of how to get back on track. So now I wanna to turn to some of my more concrete tips about managing your family life and your work life. So my first tip is to banish the idea that you can do it all. So 
society is selling us a false narrative. Um, and you probably have some notion of this anyway, especially if you have close friends um, that are also parents and also honest about the struggles of parenthood. Uh, but I think it bears repeating. There's just not enough hours in the day. Um, so really, we need to figure out what's important to us um, and what our non-negotiables are. And really just like settle into this idea of good enough. And the parallel here is to David's idea of not letting perfect be the enemy of good. So what does this look like for me? Um, I love having a really clean house. I've always loved cooking uh, really nice and elaborate meals for my family. But even more, I love feeling accomplished in my work. Uh, and really one of the most important things for me is that I can be stress-free when I'm with the kids and they come home and I, I don't have sort of work issues playing in my mind um, and I can really be present and there with them. So inevitably this means that our house is a bit more cluttered than I like um, and that all my, my weekday meals are only taking me you know, 20, 25 minutes to prepare. My, my non-negotiable here is that the room that I am working in, so I, I work from home, and this room has to be, you know, relatively tidy and clutter-free. Um, so I typically start my day with a, with a quick 15-minute clean of the room that I'm in. Now, some of you might have heard um, this famous advice to women to lean in. And here the idea is that, um, you know, if, if, if a woman works hard enough and she asserts herself enough, she can thrive both at home and at work. Um, but I think if you're balancing at all a working life and a family life, you know, you're already leaning in. And this idea that you're not trying hard enough or doing it right if you don't have this sort of perfect Instagrammable life is a very short step away from parental burnout. So if you, if you want to be able to do this sort of creative deep work and produce high quality research, then my advice is don't lean in, lean out. Um, but don't take this the wrong way. So what I mean here is to protect your work time and protect your home and family time and really use your success in one to drive, to drive you in the other. And this is, um, this is where David's advice around building a routine and blocking out time, I think, is really useful for people with families. So it really breaks down the idea that more time at work equals better work. So here the idea is don't work more, work better. So really try and find time for at least one block of deep work a day. Um, and I'm positive, I'm positive that if you can sit down for at least three hours of deep work a day, you're going to feel really accomplished in your working life. And now the, the other side of this is, is that it gives you a lot of flexibility with how you can divvy up the remainder of your day if you need to take care of children, say, or you have other sort of household tasks to do. Now, relatedly, um, apply David's tips of automating or delegating tasks where you can but not just with work, but with family and home tasks too. So often when I'm cooking dinner, I cook extra, so I don't have to think about what to make for lunch tomorrow. Um, or I'll cook extra and put it in the freezer for another dinner on a different day. So look for places in your daily routine, um, not where you can multitask. So I don't think multitasking is a good idea. And I, I especially think that trying to multitask um, like by you know, doing work with your kids around is a really, really bad idea. I don't think that anyone can really do that. Um, but the idea is here, look for um, places in your daily routine um, where you can take advantage of whatever you're doing to achieve cross-cutting results that make things easier on yourself. So I'll give you uh, an idea of what I'm thinking here. So in the ideal world, um, I would have, you know, an hour every day to myself to exercise. Um, but in reality, there's just really not enough time in the day. Um, so what I do is I do the kids nursery run in the morning. Uh, it gets me outside every day for five minutes of walking. And half of that is on the way home by myself, which I can use in different ways to get me ready for my work day, either by you know just relaxing a little bit and listening to music or catching up with the news 
or maybe thinking about how I'm going to respond to an email or to a question maybe a colleague has asked me. And finally, I find having um, a sort of transition time between my role as a caretaker and my role as a researcher is really important. So I actually often set an alarm at the end of the day um, to give myself some transition time before the kids are coming home to sort of wrap up whatever I'm doing and also just take a minute for, for myself. And I do this because I think it can be quite jarring to move straight from doing work to taking care of the children. And especially if you're transitioning from deep work, so you're, you know, in the middle of figuring out a problem or, or running an analysis or, or writing a piece. Um, so I, I find that having this sort of transition time built into my routine is really important. So, so that was the sort of first set of tips. Um, and again, the idea is so to banish the idea that you can do it all. Um, think about what's important to you and how you can protect that um, and give, really give yourself some grace on these other things. Um, use your academic routine advantageously to give you some flexibility in managing your family life. And really look for, again, these opportunities in your daily schedule where you can achieve these sort of cross-cutting results. And that was one pile of sort of tips. And another set of tips is focused around this idea that just as a work routine is really important to avoid academic burnout, having a routine for your family can help you avoid parental burnout. Now, something I've learned over time is that kids really thrive with consistency. So if you have young kids, you, you already know this, you know that some of the biggest struggles come when it's um, time to transition from one activity to another. So when it's time to stop watching TV and put on your shoes or time to stop playing and brush your teeth. But what I found is that um, if you have consistent daytime routines and kids know what to expect, this can really make things more calm in the house. And Consistent bedtimes in particular, I think, are really important, uh, especially if you have young kids. And this can mean better sleep habits for children. Um, it can mean more, more time for yourself in the evening or more time to hang out with your partner. But probably most importantly, this can mean better sleep for you. Now, David has often talked about the importance of sleep for productivity, for work productivity. Um, and anyone with a young child has probably endured sleep deprivation on more than one occasion and really knows firsthand the importance of sleep. Now, not just for work, but also really for your own sanity um, and your ability to, you know, just get on with the bare minimum in the next day. So I really can't stress the importance of finding a bedtime routine for kids enough, and especially when, when they're younger. Um, a routine that helps them to be able to sleep independently through the night. Now, on the other hand, if you do have a small infant at home, especially one that's younger than four months, it's very unlikely that you're going to be getting, uh, you know, six straight hours of sleep a night. And I, I've read that the average new parents get around about four hours of sleep a night. And I know from experience that those four hours won't be consecutively. Now, when you have older infants or toddlers, um, you're going to go through these periods where you also won't get those six hours. So for example, because of sleep regressions, when they're hitting certain developmental milestones, um, it could be due to teething um, or even illness. So for instance, my four-year-old, we're just getting over like a stomach bug that he has kept him up at night for the, for the past couple of weeks. Now, I used to get really anxious when I knew that I wasn't going to get a solid set um, of hours of sleep. So at one point, I researched really exactly how much sleep one needs to function on. And I came across this idea, um, which is that we often think about sleep as one sort of solid, unchanging state of consciousness. Um, but we actually often cycle through different stages of sleep. Um, where each cycle lasts for about 90 minutes. Now, ideally, we should have around four or five of these sleep cycles a night. But really, in those early newborn days, um, and then these like nights that um, you're up and down with the kids, 
I think if you can get at least three of these cycles in, uh, then you're going to feel pretty okay the next day. And I say this to hopefully alleviate any anxiety um, that you might have about not getting enough sleep with young kids around. Um, but I also say this to hopefully give you a sort of starting place for thinking about a strategy for getting some full sleep cycles in on those nights where you might be, you know, going into the kid's bedroom every 45 minutes. So what, what, what might this look like? Um, this might look like going to bed 90 minutes earlier than usual to get, uh, you know, an extra sleep cycle in or trading off waking wake up times uh, with your partner. So at one point when my son was having a difficult time sleeping through the night, um, my husband and I would divide up the night. So say I would get up if somebody woke up between 9 and 2 a.m. and he would get up if anyone woke up from 2 a.m. on. And this really ensured that each of us got at least three or more of those cycles in a night, even during this difficult time. So those were some tips around setting up a routine, um, not just for your work, but also for your family, um, and how to alleviate any anxiety you might have about not getting enough of sleep. Um, and here the idea was really to think about sleep in these 90 minute cycles so that you can maximize any of the sleep that you're able to get. And in this sort of final bundle of tips, um, I'll talk a little bit about self-care. Now, David has talked about self-care with regards to work productivity and the importance of keeping yourself nourished and fulfilled. And as a parent, it's just as important to do all these things. But if you are a parent, you probably know it's also really difficult to, to prioritize your own self-care when you're responsible for the care of others. So for instance, I've definitely had days where I get halfway through the day and I've realized that the only food I've eaten all day is the leftover food from my kid's plate. Um, and at the same time, we have society and, and you know people are always telling parents to practice self-care. They say things like, you can't pour from an empty cup. And while all of this is true, I think this can really turn self-care into, into feeling like just another thing to add to your to your to-do list. And often what isn't shared is to how to take advantage of your day to practice self-care when your day already feels overwhelmed with obligations. Um, so one way of dealing with this is what I said before about thinking about the things you can do in your day to achieve cross-cutting results. So, you know, when I'm bringing my, when I'm walking back home after dropping my kids off at nursery, I take some time for myself there. But another way I like to think about self-care um, when finding time seems impossible is through this notion of micro-pleasures. Now, in short, micro-pleasures are just small, everyday things that bring you happiness. And I realize that in talking about things like this, it might come across as a little cheesy or cliche. Um, and I'll share what some of my micro pleasures are in a moment. Um, but I just want to say that the point of these micro pleasures is, is that there are these rather ordinary things that bring you a lot of pleasure. Um, and when you can't find time for self care in the form of, you know, an hour long yoga session or, or like a spa treatment or something, if you can find ways to like sprinkle your day with um, some of these micro pleasures, then this can go a long way towards grounding yourself and alleviating some of those stressors that build up during the day, um, especially in terms of managing things at home and things at work. Um, okay, so I'm gonna now switch over and tell you a little bit about um, some of my micro pleasures. And as I do this, I want, I want you to think about what some of your micro pleasures might be. So one of my first micro pleasures and most important one is um, drinking a glass of wine and listening to music while I'm cooking dinner, um, even if, again, it's just a, a 20, 25 minute dinner job. Um, so I don't know what this is. I think it has something to do with reminding me of my former self before kids or something, but it just, it brings me a lot of joy. I often look forward to the end of the day when I know that I'm gonna go out into the kitchen and just have this like short little time by myself of listening to some, some music and just drinking a nice glass of wine. 
Another one of my micro pleasures might seem sort of strange. It's actually, it's drinking um, like a flat white with a sparkling water. So I don't know when it was, I think a few years ago, I was at a cafe and when they brought me my flat white, they also brought me a glass of sparkling water. And since then, it's just been one of the things that I enjoy the most. I, when I have this in the morning, this combination, it really sets my day off in a really nice way. This other one might seem, this is where the sort of cliche cheesiness might come in a little bit, but one of the things that I really love is sort of going outside on one of these really cold and sunny days. Um, think of your like typical New England fall morning or something. Um, I don't know what it is. It's just, it's just a thing. And I think probably micro pleasures are hard to describe for people. Um, why they have them, but this is one of my main ones. And this final micro pleasure is probably the strangest of all of them. Um, I think I have this micro pleasure of this the smell of wet leaves and sort of wet nature. Um, again, I don't know what this is. I in thinking about this, I think it might recently have something to do with the fact of being um, stuck in London for the past. Oh, I don't know, year and a half during the pandemic and not really having a chance to go out into nature and, and smelling again what nature actually smells like. Um, so that's where I'll wrap up um, for today. We have some, some time for questions and, and um, comments. Again, share with me your micro pleasures. Um, and, and if you have any parenting tips, share those as well. Um, Courtney, fantastic. Thanks so much for sharing all this with us. I, I don't know about you watching, but I learned a lot. And I, I see a lot of the comments coming through. I'm just going to pull some of these on. Um, Elaine writes that she loves the, the idea of micro pleasures. And I think it's such a a simple thing that we often forget about, especially if we just feel like we're running from one thing to the next. But to have those those, those pauses in the day or find those spaces um, to really reward ourselves uh, for the things we've accomplished and also to take a moment to just reset. I mean, if you're constantly squeezing, squeezing, squeezing all the energy uh, and productivity out of yourself, you can't kind of you can't recharge, let your neural synapses re refuel, repower, and start firing again. So I like this a lot. Um, and and uh, some somebody calls uh, this this idea. I'm, so I'm not really sure what you mean. You might have to explain this. I call this idea "wow moments." Um, I don't know if you're referring to the micro pleasures, but um, however you like to think about it, uh, what, whatever works for you. But but that idea is just kind of like that 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 me time that 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 you've you've protected for yourself. I mean, I think one of the th things I wanted to talk about too, that, that really jumped out to me. I mean, there's been uh, all this talk about lean in and other things you need to do. And you're kind of saying the opposite to, to lean out. Can you just, uh, I want to make sure I didn't miss it. Can you just expand a little bit more on that? Because that seems to buck some of the prevailing advice that says, Oh yeah, you sure. If you just do this and this and this, you, you can, you can have it all. Um, if you, lean in, but you're, you're saying the opposite. Tell, tell me more about that. Yeah, I think, you know, I think we can't do everything. Like we can't be 100% an academic, 100% a parent, 100% have this like immaculate home. I think we really need to, you know, do a little deep thinking and think what are the most important things to me and put little protective barriers around those. So if you know, being accomplished and producing a lot of academic high quality work is important to you, then you need to really focus on on that and finding ways to support that. And I don't, you know, parents, of course, what's also going to be important to them is spending quality time with their children. So inevitably, this means you have to focus on some things at the expense of other things. And that might be, you know, that you don't sign your kids up to five different sports in, you know, fall, this fall or, or, um, yeah, just finding, it shouldn't just be this blanket assumption that you can do everything. You have to find what's important to you. So so how do you balance this? So I say this because I'm not a parent myself, but I can kind of imagine some parents are, you know, in this hyper parenting area, they're doing everything for little Johnny. And then does that make you feel bad that they've, they've got their kids doing five sports and 
the rest of her lives and then somehow do you feel like you're you're a, a less good mom because you're not hyper parenting how do you deal with those feelings yeah i think actually the opposite if you if you realize when you do try to do all of those things and you realize that it's impossible, then you feel like you're failing on so many different fronts. But when you can focus in on what's important to you and you feel that success and you feel that that you now have this nice quality time with your children when you're with your children and you have this nice quality time and this nice work environment mm. for yourself, then you know, you you can see what the difference is. It's so fascinating because a lot of things you talk about are, are just general good practices. One thing we've got a training in this group, the optimization of one, where I really encourage people in this group and the, the progress to the PhD, climbing this mountain, to focus on that that one thing that's the most important thing and make sure you get that right and don't dilute yourself and start doing many things inadequately. And one thing that happens probably as a parent too is you get pulled in so many directions and you've got to set boundaries and learn how to say no or you, you end up not just doing yourself a disservice, but also in this case, children and others who who depend on you. So it really just strikes me as a reflection more than anything, Courtney, that a lot of these good habits to have in research and as an academic and being successful really carry straight over to your personal life as well. Yeah, there's so many parallels with with setting up your day as a as an academic and as a professional and setting up, you know, your life at home for sure. Top. Totally. So one thing, just coming back to the lean in for a second, um, and I think this goes to to this idea of automate and scaling. I mean, one critique is that, well, okay, well and good for somebody who's incredibly wealthy to pay for all this home support and meals made and other things. But, you know, the reality is as a graduate student, you might not have that financial uh, capacity. And so, so how do you kind of go about thinking uh, about that? For yourself, because yeah, you also have limited budget. How can yeah. how do you go about that without just throwing buckets of money? Uh, at yeah, them? so that goes a little bit towards this idea I said of giving yourself a little bit of grace. And for me, that means that at any time, there's probably a whole slew of toys all over my living room floor. And at one point in that in my life, that would have really bothered me. Um, but I've kind of just realized that's not what's important. Like if if in all these other ways of things that are important to me, I can excel at those, then I can walk by the living room and just sort of ignore that the toys are there. So again, okay. it's not trying to live up to all these standards. I'm not sure that actually anyone is doing it all and being successful. I think, you know, there might be yeah. some images and idea of this on social media. But really, if, you, if you're if you a parent and you talk to other parents, then we all know that, this, you know, nobody's living that life, really. Nobody's. Yeah, it's like the manicured version that gets posted on social media. But it's exactly if you look, if you peel back that curtain, you'd see, well, you know, everybody's got toys strewn all over the room. Right. Um, uh, OK. Um, uh, Elaine puts a comment here, though, that comes to th this point uh, uh, about uh, about struggling. I mean, he, here is one about lone mothers. Um, yeah, just taking a second to read this um, single mom with several children living in poverty and precariously living has no time or room to write. This ha it just so happens you just wrote your paper that we mentioned earlier in the session on precariousness. So it's something that Gordy, I know you happen to know a thing or two about, um, but continues to say the homeschool can't afford daycare. Their family is very far away. Um, you know, what, what, what would you say in response here to someone in this situation? Again, I think it goes back to doing what you can and finding finding the things that are most important to you. And, you know, as far as work goes in this situation, again, if you can just carve out one block of time a day, you know, two or three hours, then I this really gives you a lot of flexibility with what you can do at home. Um, again, this sort of ideas that I present today, it's going to look different for everyone. Um, but I think what would be important here is just finding, you know, a little bit of time, you're blocked off, you're protecting your work time. And then when you are with the children, um, you can be just with the children. And that's it, too. Okay. Okay, that's good advice. Um, Lydianne is saying, you know, uh, such an amazing presentation. Uh, thanks for introducing Dr. Courtney to us. Uh, D G Courtney is in the group. So, um, Courtney, I'm speaking for you a bit here. But do reach out to her if you have some questions. I mean, Courtney, we share the same open access ethos, spirit of really wanting to serve 
grads and and help you through manage and balance some of these challenging sides of research that you can really thrive as a grad where, where so many do struggle. Um, Amina comes to us and and says. All this is a lot to do in one day. Um, yeah, um, I, I mean, I don't, I don't know if you have small children, but I mean, I, I have to say because I want to have family one day. I, I, I listen to you, Courtney, and I think I feel an extra fire uh, under me, knowing that I need to be as productive as possible so that I can be even not starting now, so that when I do have family. Ideally, I'll, I'll build up my career into a good place. And it's something I wanted to ask you about. You know, there's different advice on this because I know some people may not have family who is watching this, but if they're thinking about having family. Is there is there a right time? Is there an optimal time, or is any time a good time? Or what what would you say? Yeah. That's a question I commonly get, and and I don't always know what the the right answer is. There's uh, I, I was told, well, maybe during grad school, or maybe then when you have tenure, but that leaves this big gaping hole. What, what, yeah, what's, what's I don't know. It, yeah, my take is that it, there is a lot to think about, and it, a lot of it comes down to sort of, you know, what's going on with you personally. Um, in Norway, it's a great time to, to start a family just because of the protective leave policies there. Um, but also, when I was thinking about, you know, having children, I also... I did think about how it was fitting um, with the timeline of my project. So I was on always um, temporary research projects. So I thought, you know, after I think with Orson, I, my oldest, um, it was when I, I had I had gotten a good um, head start on the project um, and that I knew that my pregnancy would take me through to, to almost the end. Um, and that when I when I came back from leave, I'd have um, another year to sort of wrap the project up. So I did think sort of strategically of how everything would fit in with my work life. Mm. Um, so I think it is worth thinking about. But that said, I I also know that if it wasn't the perfect match for for how my work life was going, I don't think that I would have delayed too much my my sort of desire to have a family. Okay. So I think there, you know, there is a there is a way to make it work. Um, well, yeah, I mean, you're definitely the stars aren't aligning. You're definitely a testament to to making that work and in style with with six published papers as your top top journals. I mean, you say you're just figuring it out, Courtney, but um, that is quite impressive. One thing I wanted to ask you. Um, so you talked about this point about factoring in transition time, and I, I think I'm guilty of this. In the past, because even when I'm working and I might uh, have, have a relationship with my partner, and then suddenly my my workflow gets my partner doesn't mean to, but breaks up my workflow, and I sometimes it's kind of jarring because I'm really in the zone, and uh, it, it just I, I end up uh, it breaks my train of thought. So, but then you know she needs something from me. So <laughs> how, how do you? Well, so you factor it in transition time. What do you do? Do you go uh, seal yourself away in a room so that um, that you're not bothered, or wh what do you? <laughs> yeah, do you I do? do that essentially. Um, okay. Um, um, but I, I think like so that goes to just really it, it is protecting your your time and having these sort of um, yeah protective barriers around your time, and and also not trying to multitask because when I'm if I try to do something with kids around, then it's not just interrupting my workflow. Then I'm, you know, I'm, I'm probably not the best parent in that moment either. Just like, you know, not really paying attention to, to what my child needs and just sort of, you know, doing the bare minimum of, of sort of getting them satisfied so I can get back to work. So yeah, having these barriers up um, and these sort of transition times Okay. Yeah. No, I, I like this idea of kind of um, barricading myself in, in the room. But I, I've often argued on productivity that it can be very good to per deprive yourself anyway of other stimulus just to help you achieve your peak flow. And if you want to learn about that, there's some of our productivity trainings you'll find in the productivity guide in this group where I talk about getting into that, but also in a way to, to pr protect relationships because 
I don't know. As a parent, I could just see like if, if your, your kid stumbles into the room and wants to play and you're in the middle of the train of thought, you might not respond in the in as loving a way <laughs> to your child as yeah. you normally would do if you weren't distracted. And you don't want that, that to exactly. happen. Exactly. Right. So – so that may that makes a lot of sense. Uh, yeah. it really makes I will a lot say of sense one one thing that can be hard for a parent, and I mean, in terms of doing it, even if your your kid is at you know school or childcare all day, a parent can't really turn off their phone and just say, "Okay, I'm I can't receive any messages" because you don't know when something's gonna come through to the school at all. So one thing I've I've done is put like a different ringer for for when a call comes in my phone um, from from one of the schools. So I can turn off like all the noises from my phone, except know that also that I'll get this emergency call if, if something were to happen. Yeah, but, so that's a, re- that's a really nice tip. Just uh, I do that too with loved ones. So my family can get through it. My phone is usually, yeah, it's living, my phone's usually living on, on silent mode most of the day anyway. Um, just because the idea of being controlling our use of technology, social media, and not letting it it control us. How do you manage some, some things that I suggest, like a no social rule in the morning and evening before bed? Are you able to sustain that with children? Yeah, I, it's really easy because I get up in the morning and I have to do a thousand other things for them. <laughs> so I'm not tempted by the phone. Um, and actually, that is really nice because then it's after I'm dropping them off from nursery that I that's the first time I can check my email. So <laughs> they actually okay. help me in that sort of way. Um, yeah. So think about that. Others, do you think parenting? I mean, some people tell me that parenting has actually forced them to be very productive and efficient in ways that had never been before. And that, um, that that there were some really unexpected side benefits and blessings that that came from that. Do, do you feel that way? Yeah, definitely. So before I had children, it, it's not just also a, an issue of efficiency, but like, um, you know, having a life outside of work. So I would just because I like the work that I'm doing, but I would I didn't have any boundaries, really. So I would just be working all the time on the weekends, like late into the night. Mm. Um, and, you know, at some point you do step back and you think, what am I doing, like spending my my Saturday doing this or something? But when you have children, then you can't do that. You have <laughs> your your weekends are with them. So it's been really nice in that way to sort of like reclaim back some of this off time from work. Yeah, I, I have heard of some people having a natural way that children in a way provides a natural shield to say, no, no, I can't do this yeah. because I have to be with my kids. And well, everybody gets that where when you don't have children, sometimes people have harder coming up with a good reason to say no to some some things. Yeah, so, even a uh, good reason for themselves. But I think, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there are many good reasons, but um, definitely, definitely a card the, that you can play. Oh, I, I want to ask you. Kind of strategically, because you've managed to keep a productive research flow, even going through maternity leave and others. Are, are there ways you've planned your projects or planned your collaborations to keep that momentum going? Did, did you have an, Did you have a plan from the outset? How, how did you do that? Yeah, a little bit was, like I mentioned before, like planning when my pregnancies were going to be and how that was going to sort of fit in with project timelines. Um, but other strategies were like, you know, like setting myself up for the sort of work that I would be doing, for instance, when I was just slowly coming back to work with the twins was undertaking work that, you know, I would be leading on and sort of setting the pace for um, doing um, more sort of, you know, commentaries or or things that involved less sort of deep work so things that I could just do in 15 minute 20 minute increments mm-hmm. when the kids were really young and that's all the time that I could get so so thinking about the sort of work that you can produce um, in whatever stage you're in if it's pregnancy um, or like newborn days um, okay so so that, important to recognize that then those blocks of deep work at least in the newborn period you just have to kind of factor you may not happen yeah okay. it's i think it's really hard and also you're getting very little sleep those days um and also you should prioritize just being with your child probably at that at that of course. age so did you have colleagues who then picked up some of the slack or how, how, what did you did you did you plan that out so that you could kind of pass pass the baton over to them for that period or how did you 
Yeah, How some of that? yeah, some of my projects I I did do that. Like I said, I a lot of the projects were just sort of like these things that I could just put out without having to to sit down and get in deep into deep thoughts. So then I could you know pass things off for for a little bit off to to other coworkers. Um, yeah. Okay, that, that's really valuable, guys. Do do pop in in the chat any questions. For Courtney, share some of your experiences with us. We, we'd love to hear uh, any tips or tricks or strategies you've had to balance some of these really common, really common challenges um, that I, I know several of you with families can relate to. Several of you who may not yet have a family but are thinking about it or uh, e even those of you who are facing a productivity crunch in, in your own lives. Um, do share with us some of your best tips. We always like to hear from them and, and pass on any questions you may have here for Courtney. Um, Cordy, I, I also want to ask you too, you, you know, you said you don't have it all figured out. Um, it, you know, there's, there's also space kind of for non-judgmental space in this group for open reflection. What things personally do you think, I mean, you're doing a lot of things well, but what things do you feel like you could do, could do better? Because I always advocate for myself. I always feel like I, I'm on a process of continuous growth and steady improvement. What areas, when you say in avoiding parental burnout and doing better, what things are you kind of focusing on in, in or working on yourself at the moment? Yeah, well, I sort of, you know, I I, I have these tips, but I, I don't always follow them. So like I said, um, these past couple of weeks, I my son has been home um, from school and the nights have been really disruptive. Um, and that can just the knowing that I'm not going to sleep, for instance, can give me a lot of anxiety or just mm. thinking like, well, I have to do all this stuff tomorrow and I'm going to be woken up like five times. How am I going to get those things done? Um, so I do like f fall off the track of, you know, keeping in mind um, this idea. And actually it's told to parents all the time that everything is just a phase um, and, you know, you just have to sort of ride out these, these little blips. And I think I often, sometimes I, I forget that. And I think, you know, I just get focused, so focused on the problem at hand that I forget this is only going to last for like two or three more days. Mm. Then he's going to be fine. He's going to go back to school. Um, with my, with my oldest son, when he was first born, I, this was like a really terrible thing for me because, you know, after you have your child like immediately you're not sleeping anymore like your life is just thrown into chaos and i remember just even the first night after he was born thinking like oh my gosh what have i what have i done to my life i'm i'm never gonna sleep again like and you know the early days can be very trying and difficult and i just didn't keep it in mind ever that this is such a short time and mm. you know when they're that young even you know the following week things change and get a little bit better and then mm. you know after that it gets a little bit easier it gets a little bit easier um and then also when it's the same sort of thing like when things are going really good like take advantage of it because something else will change and you'll go through these periods of difficulty again so sort of just keeping in mind this thing that every parent is told is that everything is just a phase um, mm. That's still something that I, I struggle a bit with and, and I always need to remind myself. Okay. So kind of not letting yourself kind of get sucked in this vortex of yeah. it's all going to fall apart and it, it's all, all, all doomed and going to hell, but yes. um, <laughs> that, that you will get through it. And right. sometimes you've got to persist, persevere and have some grit. Uh, yeah. And, and that's what I like some of the tips I talked about is to get you back on track there. So like sometimes I, you know, I'll be frustrated and I'll be working through something and I'll realize that there's so much I could do to my environment right now to make this such like a better, a more enjoyable moment. Like I could, you know, this thing that I'm doing, maybe I don't need to focus too much. I could have music playing and like make this moment so much mm. better or, or I could go get a coffee or treat myself to something to just, you know, get through that little tough period. Like, bring in some of these, this idea of a micro pleasure, like go for a 20 minute walk yeah. outside. So is that something you're conscious of Courtney, when you're, you're starting to feel like, oh, that an anxiety is creeping in, or I'm, I'm losing this feeling of control and what's going on. Um, is there, is there that kind of crisis tactic that you have up your sleeve? Yeah. Is yeah, that the micro definitely. pleasure or? That's the uh, micro pleasure. Yeah. That's just realizing like, you know, and this is, 
even if you block off those three hours of work, like everyone I think who's an academic knows that you could sit there for three hours and you don't, you don't get very far. It's just knowing that some days are just going to be like that. Um, mm. And yeah, if, if you sprinkle in some of these micro pleasures during those days, I think you can like sort of sit back and just appreciate that this is a thing that we have to go through. It's going to end soon. I'm going to have another productive day tomorrow or the next day. Um, and just, yeah, not, not get sucked into that vortex. Nice. I have to say on micro pleasures, I'm with you. Uh, again, those micro pleasures are good, I think, for all grad students, but especially for parents. I mean, mine tonight is probably going to be a fine uh, glass of Italian Amarone red wine, which is <laughs> one of my favorites, uh, one of one of the many perks of being in Italy. Um, Courtney, <laughs> thank you for sharing all this with us. Um, also, guys, in the chat, share your micro pleasures. We, we love to hear about those. Others like to hear about those. Um, I mean, just too often we, we find students um, you know, don't, don't really tap the power of the community available to them. And this is one powerful community for networking with like-minded students, sharing, as Courtney says, opening up the beginning of the conversation on challenges you face as parents um, and, and kind of to learn collectively uh, from, from our shared struggles, hardships, but also wins in ways that you've developed to manage, create systems, make challenging things more enjoyable, like Courtney just talked about putting music on in the background or other things you can do to to take some of the monotony or maybe tedious aspects uh, out of the equation or make them at least more enjoyable. Um, but Courtney, really, uh, this has really been a, a fantastic. You've got a wealth of knowledge. I, 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 I sometimes think you're just way too modest. Um, and I think we're coming to a good point to, to stop. Again, uh, Courtney just uh, is one of our coaches in Fast Track Grad. If you'd like to, to schedule a time to, to chat one-to-one, -one, get some of Courtney's suggestions and tap her wealth of experience and knowledge on parenting, um, do, do feel free to send out a DM. If you're interested in some more of our general productivity training, I've really been struck by some of the overlaps, um, go straight to the guide section of the Facebook group and you will find over three hours of masterclasses just on productivity uh, alone. It's going gonna, it's gonna to save you so much time. You'll wonder why you haven't taken on board some of these productivity tips before. Um, guys, I hope you all have a fantastic weekend and find your own micro pleasures here. And uh, Courtney, we will be in, be in touch soon. Thank you again so much for joining us today. Thanks. It's been a real pleasure. All right. Bye for now, everybody.